Welcome to everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. We have a lovely, compelling hour planned for you today. Bill Galston, guest of honor and author of the week. Uh, you have an eager crowd. The first question from Arch Puddington has already popped up in chat. Wow. Hang on to your hats. I think there's more to come. Bill Galston, I will let our moderator, Susie Garman, introduced him more properly, but he's a member of the editorial board of American Purpose. He's the co-creator of American Purpose. He's a senior scholar and prolific writer and policy intellectual at the Brookings Institution. He's written a splendid piece this week for us, which will be the subject of conversation. My dear, dear friend and colleague, Susie Garman, has agreed to moderate. She's senior editor with American Purpose and has done a little bit of everything. And I think you all know her and adore her from Pat Moynihan's aid to writing columns for the Wall Street Journal, for scholar, to scholarly work at AEI and much more. So Bill, welcome, everybody welcome. And Susie, you have the microphone to further introduce our guest of honor, his article, and moderate the discussion. Thank you. All right, it's a, it is a great pleasure to be here with Bill. Uh, I am so old that I think I first met him when we shared a floor mat during rest time in preschool, but, but we'll move forward. <laughs> Bill has written a magnificent piece for American Purpose. Uh, explaining that we do in fact have a heartland that's bitter towards its elites. And my question, since I assume that all of us have read the piece, my question to you, Bill, is what has changed so radically from the time when we looked at this polity in say the 1950s? Uh, well, f first of all, Susie, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and especially to have you as moderator. Uh, and let me, let me explain first why I wrote this piece. Yes. Uh, I think we're all, you know, aware in my case, you know, painfully aware, you know, of the, of the political events of recent years you know, culminating in the storming of, of the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Uh, but what I, want, what I want to argue is that the antecedents of that event, you know, go back a very long way. Uh, it, is, it is natural, I think, for people like, people like me, you know, to to dismiss all of this, you know, in, in term, you know, in psychological terms, uh, in moral terms, in political terms, uh, to be very angry, uh, to, you know, to believe that, you know, that, you know, this insurrectionary behavior, you know, rests on causes that are really indefensible without merit uh, dismissible, uh, if they can be suppressed, suppressible. <laughs> uh, and what I'm, what I'm trying to do instead is what the lawyers would call an argument against interest. You know, I am trying to get inside the heads of people who dislike, resent, and even in many cases despise things that I care about and people of what I will broadly call my class care about. Uh, I think it is extremely important to make a, a strenuous effort to understand this phenomenon from the inside and to open ourselves to the possibility that the resentment may stem from causes that cannot be so easily dismissed as entirely without merit even if they may not be sustainable in the terms in which they're stated. And I think this is particularly important because 
we have a badly divided country, as badly divided as any time in my lifetime, uh, and maybe longer than that. Uh, and you know, and the reconciliation to the extent that it's possible of these warring American tribes is really a precondition for most everything we care about, I believe. You know, you know, a house united doesn't necessarily thrive, but a house divided against itself surely won't. And right now we are a house divided. Okay, what has changed since the 1950s from the standpoint of the people I'm talking about, just about everything, right? We had an economy, you know, that to a substantial extent was based on, uh, you know, on manufacturing and extractive industries. That's, that's largely gone. Uh, we had a population that was mostly white and mostly Christian. Uh, you know, the cultural, the cultural controversies that we now take for granted uh, were not on the public agenda, period. You know, I am old enough, and I think you know, and I think others may be as well, not you, Susie, but others, you know, to, you know, to you. remember a time when most of, most of what we're arguing about so ferociously uh, was simply not publicly discussable. It certainly wasn't publicly discussed, uh, not in polite company. Uh, we should also keep in mind the fact that for more than 40 years, uh, the gates of the United States were mostly shut to immigration, you know, and during, during that period, the percentage of, the percentage of first generation immigrants fell from about 15% to under 5%. You know, there was a great coming together. That was the period during which, you know, the people from Eastern and Central Europe who were looked down upon in the early part of the 20th century became if I can use contemporary lingo, white Americans, you know, no more, you know, uh, you know, people still called themselves Hungarians or Poles or Italians or what have you. Uh, but, you know, the ethnics turned out to be anything but unmeltable. <laughs> Pache Daniel Patrick Winnihan. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so from, from every standpoint, you know, economic, demographic, religious, cultural, you know, people who viewed themselves as the salt of the American earth, you know, the center of the American population, the purest expression of what it meant to be Americans, uh, have experienced changes that they view as marginalizing them along all of these dimensions. You know, you know they, you know, and to cite the title of one of the books on which I relied in putting this together, you know, they felt like strangers in their own country, right? They no longer recognized the country that they, that they understood themselves to be at the center of. Uh, and they asked themselves how this happened, why this happened, you know, why the manufacturing plants that used to provide thousands of jobs in small and medium-sized towns to generations of people. Why did they all shut up and, and go, you know, why did they all close and go away? Uh, you know, when was it that the federal government got into the business of telling them what they could do with their own farmland? You know, how did all of this happen? You know, why, why have people in the new mass upper middle class surged ahead when so many of their communities have withered. And they have concluded that this is not an accident, that to the extent that we have neglected them, the neglect was not benign. <laughs> uh, and to the extent that we have acted, we have acted in ways that have tended to undermine their, their interests. And to the extent that we have passed laws uh, that I have, uh, uh, you know, to the extent that they've passed laws, we've passed laws, those laws have not, have not worked in their favor. Uh, I could go on in the article, you know, I recite statistics about the disappearance of many of the basic building blocks of, 
of the rural economy and small town economy. Uh, one of the underwritten stories of the past, really, 45 or 50 years is the consequences of deregulation for so many of these communities. Uh, you know, before airline deregulation, many of them had reasonably easy access to rural or small town regional airport hubs. No longer. Uh, as recently as 30 years ago, there were 15,000 community banks in rural areas and small towns. And then, it, you know, and a few years ago, an obscure fellow by the name of Jerome Powell wrote a very fine article showing that in, you know, in the years since we essentially deregulated the banking industry in the early 1990s, the number of rural and small town banks has been cut by more than two thirds. Many of these people have no place to turn for the kinds of loans that they used to be able to get based on character and reputation rather than fitting in with the metrics and some algorithm administered by a bank 600 miles away. I could go on. So the decisions that were made you know, for purposes of economic efficiency or in recognition of opportunities for economic growth based on what was happening in companies around the world, all of these things which seemed like good ideas to many of us at the time have worked out asymmetrically. Portions of the country have benefited from these decisions, portions have suffered greatly. And the people who, you know, and, and the people who have suffered are you know, about between 15 and 20 years ago decided that they were as mad as hell and they weren't gonna take it anymore. <laughs> is, it, is it possible to tease apart um, the economics of the, the cultural changes and the attitudes of elites? It's possible, yeah, it's possible to list them. Is it possible, is it possible to tease them apart? Well, uh, look, uh, I've taken a look. I've taken a look at focus groups where people in small towns and rural areas talk about federal regulation of wetlands. Yes. Right. And you know, and you know, the questions tend along the lines of, you know, when did this little puddle in my farm become a wetland, and now why am I being told what I can do and can't do with it? Now that's that's distinguishable from the question of economic decline, right? Yeah. That's people, you know, that's people who are far away telling you what to do and telling you what to do in terms that don't make much sense to you. Uh, and similarly, you know, if, you know, if a presidential candidate, you know, says that, you know, rural people are clinging to guns and religion or another presidential candidate describes people like them as deplorable, that's not the same thing as being told what to do. That's more like being told that, uh, you know, that you are not respected. You're deplorable. <laughs> you're deplorable. You're not, you're, you're not, you're not respected. You know, there's, you know, there, there, there's something sort of disreputable about you. You're in important respects. You're not equal to us and people like us. I could go on listing the things that the people in these areas talk about when they talk about what they resent. Uh, and a lot of academics have spent a lot of time trying to say, well, you know, the demographic, the demographic variable accounts for 0.52 yes, yes. You know, of the variance and, you know, and economics and culture does that. Uh, I've done a lot of that myself. Uh, at the end of the line, I've concluded that, you know, this is a dense network of stimuli producing a common sentiment of resentment. Now, uh, I've used the term resentment a lot, including in, you know, in, including in the uh, title of my piece. And I did that very deliberately because uh, at the beginning of the piece, I tried to distinguish as best I can between anger and resentment. Yes. Okay, when somebody is angry, it's really hard to conceal that, right? 
you know, your, your, you know, your facial expressions usually change, your, you know, your skin tone may change, you get, you get red, your voice, is, your voice is elevated. You know, anger is very public, very obvious. Resentment is something that you can harbor, as the phrase goes. You know, you know, resentment means literally to feel again and again. You know, it's something that gnaws at you, right? And it, it's something that you may harbor but not express. And typically you don't express it because you think it would be useless or worse than useless. It might, you know, it might actually redound to your disadvantage. You don't feel that you have agency, that if you express it, you'll be worse off than if you, than if you didn't, either for, either for social reasons or because you'll be subject to outright repression, you know, if, you know, if you give voice uh, to, you know, what gives you this feeling of injustice and disrespect. Those are the two principal causes of resentment. You've been treated unjustly, or you've been treated with, with disrespect. Uh, and you can go on for a very long time, like Uriah Heep or Iago, <laughs> you know, harboring these feelings, hiding them. You know, and then when the situation changes and you feel empowered from one reason or another to give voice to these resentments, that's when they explode. I, I asked about the teasing apart because it affects the question of what can be done uh, to alleviate the problem. Uh, we have now, finally, what looks like a real infrastructure week. Uh, if infrastructure week turned out as one hopes, would that do much to heal the wounds or is it too late for that? Uh, look, uh, I think as, as citizens and patriots, you know, we can't allow ourselves to believe that it's too late, right? I mean, we, we have to be guided by the hope that a divided country, you know, with wise leadership and sound public policies, you know, can be, if not reconciled with itself, you know, can be enabled to reach a kind of modus vivendi, which is healthier than what we have now. Uh, and so, yes, I do think there are some things that we can do. Let me, let me just give you a handful of very practical examples. You know, a substantial portion of rural and small town America, as well as a substantial portion of any inner city America, doesn't have access to high-speed high broadband. What does that mean? Well, it makes it very difficult to participate in remote learning, which has been necessary, you know, uh, you know, during, during the pandemic. Uh, it makes it very difficult to participate in remote medicine which will, I think will become an increasingly important part of the medical system. It makes it, it, makes it very difficult to, you know, to participate as an entrepreneur or a, small, or a small businessman in the digital economy. You are left out in the same way as people in small towns and rural areas without electricity were left out a hundred years ago. Uh, and, as we did with the REA in the 1930s, we could, we could do with a rural broadband initiative in this decade. We could solve the problem inside of this decade and, you know, and make sure that everybody is connected. And as you go, connection, you know, connection to broadband has become you know, one of the economic and cultural counter, you know, components of full membership in American society and, and in the economy. We could do that sort of thing very self-consciously. We could disperse a number of functions uh, rather than having, you know, all of our advanced technology in Silicon Valley. If we thought about it a little harder, uh, we could disperse it. And there's a very interesting bipartisan bill you know, called the Endless Frontiers Act, which, you know, you know one, of, and one of the backers is the Senate Majority Leader, Chuck Schumer, 
that would establish regional technology centers so that people in rural areas would be you know, would would find it easier to participate in the benefits of of innovation. I think I think that we could do something to reunite the country economically. I think that may be the easy part of the job. Right? Reuniting yeah. it, you know, reuniting it or easier. There's nothing easy about any of this. Right. E e easier. Uh, reuniting it culturally. And here I'm about to step onto out onto thin ice. Uh, I think in the same way that we need more nationalism in our economic thinking, that is thinking about policies that will benefit all parts of the nation, I think we need more federalism in our cultural thinking. That is, you know, we should be good Augustinians and be united in all things necessary but be reasonably parsimonious in our definition of what's necessary. Now, this runs right up against the sentiment, you know, that I as an individual have a right to a certain kind of treatment, whoever I am, uh, wherever I live. That is a very fine argument when it comes to voting rights. Does that apply equally to all aspects of the cultural agenda, or could we use federalism to uh, allow, or at least not interfere with, more cultural pluralism than the relentless set centralizers think is necessary and proper? I think that's something we ought to explore very carefully, because as things now stand, you know, if the dominant eth cultural ethos is determined to impress itself on every nook and cranny of the land, then this warfare will not cease. You have just trod onto the land of wokeness. Um, would you oh, like yes. to pull back? <laughs> uh, uh, look, you know, uh, no, uh, <laughs> because, you know, you know, because uh, I would I would like to believe that our country has a future, and you know, and I'm not sure that the path that we're now on leads to that future. Uh, and you know, I feel I've you know I feel a little bit the way Abraham Lincoln felt about saving the Union. Yes. And notoriously, the priority that he established did not please everybody. Uh, but I think it turned out to be the right priority. I'm not comparing myself to Abraham Lincoln. I know. But, I know. you know, only, you know, only, you know, participating in the, the dim glow of his radiant wisdom. Yes, yes. Um, okay. Back to broadband. <laughs> Back to broadband, right. <laughs> Since that's that's easier. Um, are there are there issues that are, you know, broadband is so obvious. I don't mean to denigrate it. It's just really important. Are there others that you would put put in that category? Issues of access? Well, uh, first of all, you know, and this is the, this is the way my mind works. I find the obvious cases as revelatory as the extreme or unusual cases, and uh, you know that, that's not that's not fashionable. It makes me decidedly unwoke, uh, but. Uh, it seems to me that if something if something is obvious and has been obvious for a long time, uh, but it hasn't been done, then that tells you something about the political system, right? And so I think that you know, in the same way that George Orwell once had a line about you know restating the obvious is the first duty of intelligent citizens. Well, I think doing the obvious may be the second duty of intelligent, intelligent citizens. But yes, uh, you know, 
I mean, the new, the new economy, let me back up a step. In the, what characterized the old economy was the way in which you know, the supply chains for the big manufacturing hubs rippled right. through the rest of the economy. I, I, remember, I remember taking a drive. I was going to a small rural arts college in Western Ohio to give a lecture. And I, as I was taking a drive, uh, uh, the driver, as we passed through every small town, read the litany of small manufacturing businesses. He was, you know, he wasn't a tour guide or anything. He was, you know, he, he was a local and he wanted me to understand what was going on. So each town, you know, had its litany of small manufacturers, usually linked to the automobile industry, the tire and rubber industry, you know, yeah. one of these classic old in industries that had shut down, right? And nothing replaced them. Uh, I think we have to think much harder about a replacement for the supply chains of the manufacturing economy, because right now you have a, an urban economy whose supply chains extend out into the world, but yeah. not back into yeah. the country, right? That's a big problem. I think we can do something about it, but first we have to identify it as a problem that needs solving. Otherwise we've, nothing good will happen. We've so, certainly we've been invited to do that. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, we have many, many people who would like to ask questions. So, Susie, we, we do. Thank you. And thank you, Bill. We, we've got a half an hour left and many, many people. Indulge me first, colleagues. If you have your camera off, would you switch it on just for a moment so we can see you? And then you're certainly invited to switch it back off. But it's kind of nice in these sessions, since we can't be together in person, to see everybody. How about that? Thank you all really very much for being here today. And if you need to multitask or you feel comfortable having your camera off, feel free to do so. So uh, first, Susie, I want to draw attention to an essay that you wrote in 2019 called The Deal, 12 Steps to Restore the American Social Contract. You touch on things like federalism being part of the deal. If we have time, I'm going to come back to you to ask you about a question. I'll ask you a question about what you wrote then. Yeah. And if you might revise yeah. it today or amend it or augment it. So hold that thought. To, to you, Bill, I'm going to start with a question and I'm going to provide it as a segue to Peter Scary. Um, and Peter, you're free to say, Jeff, that's not the alley I was going down at all. But, but, but it's on my mind. Uh, you talk in the essay and you spoke today about the power of resentment. You spoke to the, the importance of respect and feeling respected and the idea of dignity. I mean, there are parts where you were speaking where I could almost be thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in that narratives of grievance become so powerful, powerful and so compelling that they can define political reality and define communities' view of the situation specifically and broadly. My, my question is, in the battle of hearts and minds, if I believe hearts often come first, what do we do to win back that part? Economic, e economic opportunity can be part, infrastructure can be part, but, but there's something, it seems to me, settling in the minds of some of our fellow Americans that is deeper, that creates this narrative of grievance, that once it's settled, it's just very, very hard to change. As in, you, us, we are the enemy and have betrayed them and are not worthy of trust. I'll stop there, mull that for a moment as I turn it over to Peter, who had a specific question about your essay and what's in and what be, may be left out in Peter's view. Peter, can I call on you? You're muted, and you're Peter. Mu you're muted. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Bill. 
thanks, thanks, Susie. I had the order right the first time when my mute was on. Um, so this is my question. Uh, what I find missing from, from your excellent essay, Bill, is the notion of disdain. Um, not the disdain the elites have for, 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 the, for the people you're writing about, but the disdain uh, that the people he writes about have for us, the elites, and our values, how we spend our time and earn our livings and what we're trying to force upon them, or at least that's, I think, how it's often seen. So you can, talking about bringing the internet or broadband to populations uh, will obviously bring economic benefits. Uh, but there's also problematic aspects of this, the kind of cultural fair, the kind of uh, negative reactions to the internet that we see among uh, affluent uh, kids who don't know how to relate to people, but know how to relate to machines. I mean, this is complicated business, as you know. So I would just say that not unlike Blacks, Hispanics, or even Native Americans, the whites you're talking about have considerable pride in their way of life and are sublimely sensitive to being condescended to by elites who are suspected of trying to get them to change their ways of life. And I think that's a big part of what we're up against. And I wonder well, what you think. Well, I, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I think there's no inconsistency between what you just said and what I wrote in the essay. And I was, you know, and I actually had you know, and extended uh, a little sol soliloquy, you know, on how much people resent being told what to do, mm -hmm. you know, independent of the content of what they're being told what, what, what to do. And uh, you, could, you could go back to classical Greek philosophy to begin to understand the roots, the roots of this phenomenon. But, mm -hmm. you know, I will use the terms that I used in my essay, they and us, okay, mm -hmm. or they and we, Mm -hmm. And, you know, they see us as telling them what to do across mm -hmm. the board, right? That's the way they see the regulatory state uh, and, uh, you know, and a lot of other things as, as well. Uh, and, you know, to some, to some extent, to some extent, they have disdain for the way they live, uh, they can see how corporations for all their misdeeds add value in the form of jobs. Mm. They don't see what the upper middle class, the people who manipulate words and symbols and numbers are adding. Yeah. You know, we're very, they see us as being very good at clipping our share as the money flows. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, but when they ask themselves, you know, what does this new upper middle class add to the common wheel? They're a little short of answers. Uh, and I think that's something we have to understand that, you know, that our privileges are not self-justifying, you know, and their moral basis is not evident to many of our fellow citizens. I mean, one of the, point, one of the points I make in the essay, you know, is at the same time that rural and small town America have declined in so many respects, we have witnessed the unprecedented creation of what I call a new mass upper middle class. Mm. You, you can, you know, you don't need to turn on the television to see, you know, to see this phenomenon. You can just look at the numbers released by the Census Bureau. I mean, the, the share, you know, the share of Americans making more than $150,000 a year in inflation adjusted dollars has more than doubled in the past 30 years, the share making more than 200,000, more than tripled. We're not now talking about moguls. You know, we're now talking about two academics in a big city. Hmm. And when my father started out as an academic, you know, the phrase genteel poverty comes trippingly to the lips and the poverty was more, more evident than the gentility. You know, now people like us are in this new mass upper middle class. You know, what do we do to deserve it? That's a question that many of our fellow, fellow countrymen are asking. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so, so thank you. And, and I will, from now on, invite people to introduce themselves. I think many, a lot of you know each other, Peter Scarry is professor of the political science department of Austin College and author and writer and a contributing editor for American Purpose. Thanks, Peter. I, I'm gonna call next on Arch Puddington 
uh, and advertise that Arch has a piece with American Purpose this week. It's titled, Not Your Father's Dictators. It's a foreign policy piece, and it's a case to understand and counter authoritarianism abroad, understanding that they're more complicated and in some ways more difficult and challenging today. That's the advertisement. Arch, if you were with us, rather than me read what you put in chat, would you like to give voice to that, please? Okay. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yep, I'm clear. Yep. I'm clear. Okay. Uh, very good. Um, so uh, I think there are two parts to this question. One is um, uh, brought to mind by the Times article yesterday about the the difficulty in transition to a green economy and what it is going to mean for the unionized workers who would lose their jobs in the uh, fossil fuel um, sector and move to wind and solar. Many fewer of them would move there and at less uh, considerably less compensation and and the article focused on their union leaders who were very uh, uh, cautiously pessimistic about uh, what was happening with this um, with this goal of the Biden project. There's that uh, which shows I think that the complication in everything that you've been saying here, but I want to add to it the question of race, which um, you did not uh, touch on uh, in the essay, but we live at a time when uh, the, the uh, explanation for every phenomenon in the United States, uh, especially the economy, the government, the culture, is uh, there's a uh, certainly a a, uh, a group of journalists, academics, activists, and others who want to uh, explain things in racial terms, uh, adding to I would suspect the the uh, resentment and other trends that you talk about in your article and. It, it seemed to be missing, but uh, I'll give you a chance now to talk about it. Well, uh, you know, first of all, in order to give voice, you know, to try to channel the people I was talking about, uh, you know, I tried to express their grievances in their terms, not in the terms, not in the terms that many of us use to try to explain these grievances. And I think that's, I think that's a big difference, right? I mean, the, you know, one, you know, one popular elite interpretation of what's going on is that it's all about race because everything is all about race. At least that's, that, that's the premise. And, and especially the, the revolt of, of these white men, you know, who, you know, who were the predominant force in the invasion, the invasion of the capital. I can tell you this, whatever the truth of the racial charges, reducing the complaints of the people I'm talking about to race drives them absolutely berserk because they see that as our way of silencing and delegitimating them. You see, you know, they say, as soon as we open our mouths, we're accused of being racist. And by the way, I did summarize that line of argument in my article. Uh, so I, did, I didn't neglect it entirely, but you're quite right to say that, that the bulk of the article was given over to summarizing and, channelize and channeling the resentments as they see the world and as they express it, as opposed to the way you know, many of us try to explain it or explain it away. Uh, and I make, you know, from a, you know, from a sociological standpoint, I make absolutely no apologies for that. You know, we can go, you know, we can proceed, you know, once the phenomena are on the table 
to ask the question of how much of this should be taken at face value and how much of it is a way of expressing racial resentment. That is a perfectly fair question. But before you can even pose that question, I think you need to start with the way people present themselves. And that's, that's what I did. That's what I did in this piece. Uh, but I, cert I certainly do believe that dismissing people's complaints as based on racism, doing that as your immediate reaction uh, is very unlikely you know, to heal the kind of breach uh, that I'm talking about in this piece, very unlikely. Well, thank you, Arch, thank you. We are, time is racing. We have about 16 minutes left. Let's see what we can accomplish. I have Doug, Mark, Nicole, and Dan. Let's see where we are. If you could be succinct. I know who you are and most do, but introduce yourselves nevertheless. Doug, you're first. Thanks, uh, Doug Olivant. I'm a senior fellow at both New America and FPRI. Uh, pleasure to, uh, this article was great. It really hit my heart after moving to DC and the suburbs in 2008 to work in the Bush administration. I decamped in September to rural Culpeper County, Virginia, unincorporated. The cable line stops about 10 miles from here. You know, while I can afford the technology to create a broadband like connection, my neighbors cannot. Um, so I, I live in the midst of a county that voted 73% for Trump, and I understand exactly the phenomenon you're talking about. Um, and definitely the conversation over beer here is why is the 5G going into the urban areas first and not coming here? Um, so there's a distinct sense of the fact that these places are being left behind. Um, very quickly, I read this in conjunction with... Um, Pedro Gonzalez's piece from last year, Don't Bother Learning to Code, about how even if you manage, if these communities manage to get a fingertip hold into uh, some type of respectable uh, it, you know, tech kind of job that they're, that's very vulnerable and can be immediately taken away from them by uh, either outsourcing or H-1B visas. Um, I guess two, two things I wanted to hit on. First, the, the oil and gas piece. It's the last remnants of the old economy. You used to be able to have a respectable middle-class upbringing in autos, in timber, in agriculture, in steel. None of those things are possible anymore. It's only in oil and gas that you can still do that. Um, and so I, to reinforce Arch's point, when you talk about, and, and my son's in oil and gas, I'm in, in incredibly aware of this. When you talk about removing the oil and gas jobs, that's the last place that a high school graduate in this country can still aspire to a middle class life. And I don't think anyone thinks the green jobs are either going to go to East Texas or will pay high school graduates six figure salaries. Um, and then I just wanted to touch last on the cultural piece. You know, this rural class has something very similar to um, to the urban underclass, but that's so well documented in rap music that we all know about the plight of the urban underclass. Um, who's talking in, in the cultural sphere about what the rural underclass is experiencing? Is that a, is that a question for me? I believe it is. Or any yes, absolutely. Up, yeah, well, look. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of country and Western music, you know, gives, gives, you know, gives expression to that set of experiences. Uh, you know, sociologists are beginning to do the hard work of figuring out what it, what it all means. Uh, you know, from a conservative perspective, people like J.D. Vance took a crack at it, whatever, you know, whatever you think of, of of that take on it. Uh, I note with interest that after the surprising results, or surprising at least to me, of November 2016, a lot of journalists were suddenly sent to places that they hadn't been to for decades, if ever, you know, to try to, you know, you know, to try to get some insight into this new phenomenon. I mean, the, you know, the fact that for so many of us, the results of the 2016 ele election were, you know, 
so disoriented speaks volumes, it seems to me, to the distinction that I made at the beginning of my essay between anger and resentment. Anger, you can hear and you can see. You know, if people are, if people are resentful, you know, they're having discussions among themselves that don't necessarily go any farther than that coffee shop that you, refer, you, you referred to. Uh, so, but I do think the country, you know, who's giving voice to this? I do think the country has gotten a big wake up call in the past five years and we're starting to pay attention. We're starting to pay attention to voices on the left and to racial and ethnic groups. And we're starting to pay attention you know, to voices on what I'll call the populist right as well. It's almost overwhelming to tell you the truth. And you know, I sometimes think that the last truly conservative class in the United States is the upper middle class. Because you know, this, this is rank heresy, but when you look at our lives, right. we have no legitimate cause for complaint. Good. Who wouldn't and, want to conserve this, right? I'm sorry? Who wouldn't want to conserve this if you're part of it? That exactly. And uh, you know, I think it you know, and I think it came as a big shock that so many people saw people like me as benefiting at their expense. This is a very old phenomenon. We could go on in this vein forever, but I think there are a lot more questions backed up, so we better get to them, but it's been a pleasure. So, so Doug, th thank you, and Bill, thank you. Nicole, you have the floor, and I ask you to be succinct. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, just as an introduction, I'm the program manager of social, cultural, and constitutional studies at the American Enterprise Institute and uh, on the editorial board here at American Purpose. So I just wanted to touch on some themes that were brought up by Peter Scarry. Um, and one of them is, you know, sure, we absolutely should get broadband and internet out to these rural communities. But I agree very much with Peter that in many ways, this is only bringing the culture war ever closer to these communities, you know, it's now that they, they, they hear through, you know, sometimes ill-informed media sources of all of the terrible things, all the outrages that liberals are committing in other communities, and suddenly the world becomes very small, and yet they still feel like they have no control over it whatsoever. So they're, they're like, broadband is, is one side of the equation for sure, but isn't the other side giving folks some sense of agency. And I've been thinking a lot about Adam Garfinkel's very interesting piece for American Purpose, The Quadrivium Fix, and especially the one section on a requirement for a kind of national service. So maybe tying a little bit too about what you were dis discussing regarding um, making sure that these communities don't feel condescended to, but also the importance of like, of, of creating some kind of encounter between the elites and between, um, between these as they feel, you know, marginalized communities, um, you know, how how would we do that without without making it seem like they are being condescended to, and and, and in fact, maybe even um, presenting it in such a way where the, the the young people who would participate in such a program of national service would feel like they they actually might be learning something from these communities. Is that possible? So so hopefully that's that's a lot in there, but hopefully. Well. Uh Look, uh, I mean, you're singing my song, Nicole. I wrote my third. Uh, I wrote my first article on the importance of national service in 1988, uh, and one of my first assignments when I walked into the Clinton White House on January 20th of 1993 was to be part of a small team, you know, designing the legislation that became AmeriCorps, and you know, and our aspiration as articulated by our candidate during the campaign was to make this as nearly universal an experience for young people as, you know, as possible that, you know, that we were using as our model, you know, uh, you know, programs where people came together across many boundaries, including geographical boundaries and engaged in common enterprises for six months or a year, whatever it was. Uh, my colleague at Brookings, Elizabeth Sawhill, uh, rather Isabel Sawhill, has recently revived, you know, exactly this idea with a central focus on bringing people together across the class and geographical divides that we now see, you know, looming so wide in 
in this country. So yes, you know, I think that, you know, I think that what you're talking about is, is very important. Uh, you know, you know, the philosopher William James, you know, more than about a century ago, write an, wrote an essay that had a big impact on me for good or ill called The Moral Equivalent of War. Uh, and, you know, it's long been my view that there is no moral equivalent of war. It's sui generis. But to the extent that there is anything approximating it, you know, it's people working together on common endeavors that they believe in and which bring people together across the lines that ordinarily divide us. And in so doing, convince each participant in the common enterprise that the, pe that, that the other people engaged in it are human beings. Yeah, they're different. The same way that people in the MGM foxhole, the, the, the MGM movies and World War II foxholes were different. Many of them had never met an Italian or a Jew, you know, or a country boy from rural Georgia, you name it. It was as big a shock to the kid from Brooklyn as it was the kid from Athens, Georgia. But it gave us a sense of something bigger that united us. Uh, uh, and far be it for me to say that we need an enemy, but maybe we need an enemy. <laughs> Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Bill. We're, we're just in the, what, the final lap. Mark Platner, you have the floor. Clock is running. If you could pose a question in a minute or maximally two. And you need to unmute. Mark, Mark you're on mute. You need to press a button. Yeah, there you go. Am I now audible? You are audible. Uh, Perfect. At last. Even I visible. It's a very powerful and persuasive argument you make, but like others, I want to ask about something you didn't talk about, which right. is, wouldn't surprise you, the international dimension. And, um, you know, many people have noted in talking about the rise of populism in different places, how many similarities there are voting patterns in Brexit versus 2016 Trump election. I think you may have pointed to this at some point yourself. But more broadly, the phenomenon that you're discussing seems to be happening in all the advanced uh, uh, industrial uh, countries. Um, and one can also say there's just a long historic pattern of opposition between rural areas and small towns in the uh, big and evil uh, metropoles. And so I'm wondering how, how would you situate your argument in terms of a broader uh, international or historical comparative dimension? Well, you know, Mark, uh, you know, as the politicians in this town say, thanks for asking, because, mm -hmm. you know, I did, you know, I did write, you know, a book that tried to do exactly that. And I was really struck by the parallels between the divisions in the United States that had produced a sort of conservative populist eruption, you know, and parallel phenomena wherever I looked. You know, you know, Brexit was the obvious one, but one of the things I began to notice is that all of the populist leaders, almost without exception, came from outlying areas rather than the nation's capital. You know, this is true for Erdogan. Uh, it is, it is true, it is true for Orban. Uh, it is Not true. Trump, though. <laughs> well, but, but it is true for Trump between, because the gap between Queens and Manhattan, you know, is as wide, you know, as the gap between, you know, as the gap between Warsaw, you know, and the Eastern <laughs> Polish hinterlands. And so, yeah, you know, there is, there is something in common about these leaders who, you know, who felt that no matter, you know, how high they rose or how much education they got, they were still viewed as outs, outsiders, still viewed with a, you know, a certain amount of, of contempt. He's not one of us by the elites and the intelligentsia in the big cities. Uh, and so in addition to all the economic drivers of this phenomenon, this outsiders, 
looking through the glass at the insiders and resenting the fact that there was this glass wall separating them. That's, that's very pervasive in the international work that I've done. And many, many of them say it, uh, or rather, you know, Victor Orban in, in a series of interviews actually, you know, talked about what it felt like to be a small town boy, you know, you know, coming from Budapest and not having the kind of savvy that the urban intellectual kids did. And uh, he always felt like an outsider. And he's taken, the re he's taken his revenge on the people who made him feel like an outsider. Okay, I'm going on too long, but, uh, but that's a long way of answering your question with a single word, namely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, you're certainly not going on too long. This, this hour was too short, Bill and, and Mark and, and colleagues were at a close. Uh, to wrap us up uh, for a bit of a different lens on some of these things, if I may advertise, join us Monday at 12 noon Eastern with Roya Hakakian, who's a Persian poet, writer, and human rights activist living in New York. She's written a gem of a book called An Immigrant's Guide to America. I think this or that will be taken up uh, as I say, through a different lens on Monday. Susie Garment, thank you so much for elegant management, the first part of the conversation. And I'm just sorry we don't have time to, to push you. We will another time on your, as mentioned, 2019 essay on the deal, how to restore the social contract in America. Bill, you've done us a service by writing for us, by speaking today. There's so many threads to pull on. Uh, I was... Uh, intrigued by the one, the exchange between you and Doug over country music giving voice to some of these things and some of our fellow Americans. It made me think, Bill, of my favorite song by country artist, Toby Keith. Up until now, I thought my favorite song was Toby Keith writing about his girlfriend. Now maybe I'm gonna re-listen to it this weekend. Maybe he was writing about elites. The song is you ain't much fun since I stopped drinking. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, Jeff. Yes, Toby Keith. Yes, yeah. Bill. One more, one more thing. Yo, know, yo. Know, as a veteran classroom teacher, uh, I am very distressed <clears throat> that there were questions we didn't get to, uh, and so let me let me make an offer. Uh, first of all, here is my email. It's wgalston at brookings.edu. Uh, and please, please feel free to email me with the questions that you didn't, that the hour didn't allow us to reach. And I promise I will try to answer them. If I, and do me another favor, include your telephone numbers. So if I think the question is one that would be more amenable to an actual conversation than to an exchange of emails, I will call you. I recognize that my article was both short and wide ranging. And you know, there's a lot there to discuss. And I frankly have a lot to learn about a subject that I'm just dipping into for the first time. So uh, uh, please take me up on that if you're so inclined. Well, well that, that's super. And Bill, thank you for that. Let's have you and Susie back again soon to continue this conversation, but to everybody who made time, you're all busy. Thank you so much. Bill Galston, thank you so much. Great to see you. Have a great day. Good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susie.